Lanny Atkins is coming up here next. She is the president and executive vice president of sales for the Canadian Traffic Network. Over 30 years of experience at her tender age of 27. Uh, broadcasting sales, uh, knowledge gained in working with companies like McLean Hunter and Standard and Ralco and Rogers, very well respected in industry veteran. Uh, Lanny was appointed president of Canadian Traffic Network last year and is their first Canadian president. Welcome, Lanny Atkins. Thank you, Dave. I love his enthusiasm. I love confidence that he has, and that's what's going to continue to make radio as strong as it is. I don't know about anybody here, but 92% of people listening to radio is very, very hard to beat in any medium. So, well said. Thanks, Dave. CTN is proud to be the presenting sponsor of Radio Interactive International Radio Summit for the past five years, and this year's lineup proves to be another hit. It's my pleasure to welcome our opening keynote speaker for this year's Radio Interactive Summit. The CRTC is under new leadership and is about to become more responsive to the needs of Canadian citizens. Tom Pentafuntis began his CRTC term as Vice Chairman of Broadcasting in April of 2011. Prior to that, he was a member of the Montreal-based law firm of Silver Sandiford and represented clients in various judicial districts in Quebec, Ontario, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. For a period of two years, Tom hosted a radio show on CKDGFM in Montreal, providing his expertise on human rights, criminal law, and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. He was also a regular contributor to the Gang of Four on CJAD in Montreal. Tom holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of Ottawa and a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in Political Science with a minor in philosophy from Concordia University. With an extensive background in both broadcasting and the law, he is well suited for his current role. Please join me in welcoming our opening keynote speaker, Tom Pentafuntis. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm also a hip hop artist. Um, <laughs> unlike the. Uh, Previous speaker, I'm not coming out of anything today. I just want to put that news flash out there for you. Um, and what's with the ungodly hour, this 8.45 in the morning? I just got in. I mean, we were at the cool house yesterday, clubbing afterwards, after hours, breakfast. We're artists. This is a room full of artists. Or a building first. I mean, we're going, we're napping at this point. And you guys are asking. So let's hang in there <clears throat> for another 20 minutes, and then we'll hit the sack. So it's uh, a real pleasure to be here and a real honor. Um, Given that you have sort of 300 people to choose from this week, that um, all of you showed up at this uh, ungodly hour, uh, I'm flattered. And at this year's International Summit, it makes clear there's a lot to be proud of and excited about uh, in this country and around the world. That the Canadian industry is thriving is a tribute to people such as yourselves. I suspect it's also because, as your conference theme highlights, more and more of you recognize the necessity of interactivity in today's digital world. I just want to give you a brief sort of lay of the land of where we're at, perhaps, and maybe some ideas going forward. Um, looking back over the sort of this century, if you will, uh, this millennia, uh, your success is all the more impressive when you look at the recent challenges you've had to overcome. You know better than anyone that you've, your world has been rocked, rock your world, by a rapidly changing technology picture. It started with the arrival of Napster and other file sharing services. Soon after, iPad, YouTube, personalized internet radio was launched. Then in rapid succession came smartphones, tablets, other mobile devices that enable listeners to find music and information from around the world, anytime, anywhere. And if that wasn't enough, 2008, we had this huge anticipated financial collapse of the world and the galaxy. It wasn't that severe in Canada, although Europe Asia and the US are still sort of suffering to pull themselves out of those doldrums. Now, despite all these setbacks, your business has survived and is once again booming. Recent study uh, released in 2011 shows that your revenues topped 1.6 billion, profits capped 300 million for the first time since 2008. So <clears throat> people can tell you we're roaring back. 
And rumor has it, rumor has it, 2012 is going to show similar numbers. That being said, in real dollars, we're still behind where we were in 2008. Uh, costs are greater than what they were in 2008. Uh, the pie is shared by more players, given the fact that more people have been licensed since then. So a lot of people often at the commission talk about how you know, we're roaring back and profits are back. Well, they are. But in reality, in real terms and real numbers, we're hanging in there. We're treading water. Uh, it's kind of a status quo situation. And in my book, I never like status quo. You're either moving forward or you're moving, or you're moving back. It's very hard to sort of hold the line. And I've used this analogy before about holding a one-goal lead in a, in a third period. It's the most dangerous kind of hockey you'd want to play. And it's the most dangerous kind of business you'd want to be in. So <clears throat> we're essentially standing still, given that. What are you going to do to get more listeners tuning in? Because competition for audiences is fierce. And many of Canada's competitors are looking at ways to leap ahead of us as they capitalize on fast-changing markets and the fast-changing world. Now, thanks to a multitude of online services available, music has become a commodity to be packaged and delivered in countless ways. To put this in perspective, and you know, Canadian Heritage tells us that um, Canadian Heritage study in 2012 found portable technologies are becoming increasingly popular in Canada. Well, that's not news to anybody in this room. I mean, it's your tax dollars being well spent. We all know the world's going mobile. Um, we all know that people are consuming music um, on their cell phones and tablets. And since everyone has access to the same platforms, uh, to the same product, sorry, on device of their choice, traditional radio no longer rules the roost. Consumers now create their own playlists. And young people are craving something different than what perhaps their parents were into back in the day. Something edgier, something fresher, something newer. When you add to that the fact that technology, mobile technology, and the connected car is around the corner. Our American colleagues that were at the uh, Future of Radio conference will likely tell you that they were blown away by the presentation. Uh, I was at CES this year. I was at CES last year. Uh, and I was really taken aback. We're talking about vehicles with software-driven dashboards and entertainment systems that will bring web-based entertainment to drivers and passengers. So dramatic developments. Another figure that's interesting out of the US, and I know my pre the previous speaker wasn't excited about US speakers and US content. I like US consultants. I, I but sometimes, yeah, it's all we have to work with. Um, and it is reflective. There's similar markets in many ways. But the interesting study is that the increase amongst Americans in consuming um, internet radio online, be it through traditional terrestrial broadcasters or strictly internet only services, went from 22 to 29%. That's a 30% jump in a year. The largest jump since they started recording <clears throat> this element in 1998. It's significant. Canada, for the time being, has been largely spared by the likes of Spotify, Slacker, and Pandora for, for numerous reasons, principally um, the fees they might have to pay. Now, that being said, if you look at the Canadian numbers and you look at the average uh, listenership over a week, from 2010, 2011, the decline is minimal, one-tenth of an hour. If you look at the trend, though, from 2007 to 2011, it's closer to an hour a week of less tunership, if you will. And those numbers are even more uh, notable in the 1824 and 2534 uh, demo. Now, is there a link between the consumption of other forms of media and the lessening of the tuning hours on, on con conventional radio? I think an argument can be pretty easily made. Unlike what's happening in the television field, and we, we talked about, uh, you talked about Blockbuster and Netflix. I mean, Netflix for the time being, for all, I mean, for the time being, it's a complimentary service. It's an add-on. And the people that are paying eight bucks a month are the people that are paying 150 bucks a month for cable and internet service at home. But the impact on the radio dial, I think, is being more felt. So there's no holding back time or technology. The ability to pick songs is an algorithm. <clears throat> and that's a long way from the days when broadcasting was a one-way operation. 
You know, in the past, radio de delivered content and advertising from the producer to the consumer. In the internet age, it's more of a two-way process. Um, anyone with a high-speed connection can produce content and reach audiences. And the consumer wants to have something to say about that content. So no matter who produces it, the, it's all more about the receiver being involved than the sender controlling the entire paradigm. In today's world, everybody wants to talk, and nobody wants to listen. Right? Sounds like my wife. But uh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> back in the doghouse. So let's get to regulation. What can regulators do? And I'm not sure regulators can hold back that tsunami. I'm not even sure it's advisable to do so. But so you can't protect this sector. Notwithstanding that fact, I think these trends present an unprecedented opportunity for our industry. Yes, we're living through transformational times, but there are a lot of exciting things happening in radio around the world. And the one thing that I want to make sure that we don't get too complacent in the same old model we've had, I don't want us to get soft and tired. I want us to be, to try and be innovative. And I know everyone's working on that. And I think we have to keep on carrying on. It's easy to sit back, sit back on our laurels, hang in there. We'll lose, you know, a tenth of an hour uh, a year. Uh, but all of a sudden, you know, people used to talk about GM back in the day, and you know, an analyst, they asked him, well, you know, GM, how you just have a 35 market share, they're now at 22, what's the future of GM? Well, they're gonna lose a half a percentage point every year until they're out of business. And that's almost what happened. So, I kind of, though, would like to say that I feel that there's an aversion to risk. And I know risk is hard, and I know innovation is hard, but I think it's essential if we're gonna be going forward and attracting new audiences to conventional radio. You know, we were at Toronto last year, and I kept telling people, you know, 23 applicants, I think there were 50, and we sort of brought them down to 23 that were appearing. And the question I always asked is, what new are you bringing to the table? I mean, do something to turn me on. Get people excited about radio today and attracting more people to radio. How are you going to increase the size of the pie? And I'm not sure it's going to happen by doing things the same old way. I mean, if another applicant comes before me and tells me I'm going to do triple A, um, I don't know if there's any more ways of doing AAA. <clears throat> and you know, other people came in the forum and said, you know what, I'm gonna get that 65 and over demographic. And I said, Re I, I just couldn't believe it. I was dumbfounded. Really? Why would you wanna do that? And why would we grant a new license to try and hang on to what's already there? How do we get more people involved? And how do we get more people interested and excited about radio? Um, because the internet's there. And uh, you know we can blame Al Gore all we want, that SOB sort of for ruining things, but it's there and it's available, and younger and older people have access to it. And we, we're just going to have to deal with that. Um, and I think you know there's some emerging trends. Um, the interactivity is a big thing, and there's all kinds of things happening all over the world. And you know this new Tampa, this Tampa station that just went crazy a little while ago. I was reading about how they're sort of expanding their entire operation to a smartphone, web-based, crowdsourced format, which recognizes that the listener is no longer a passive consumer. They want to take control. They want to be involved. And I'm not suggesting that we all copy this format or any other format, but it points to the importance of interactivity and innovation. Um, being close to your listeners, being close to the audience is, is of great importance today, much more than in the past. And I know people have spoken about it over the last couple of days, and I, I've been in and out of other meetings, and I missed most of it. But I think we need to find a way to connect both the content, to connect people to the content so that they can also use that to connect themselves with their friends and bring them all aboard. You have to be able uh, to appeal to their individual interests. And I think there's a niche marketing element here that comes into play, especially on the online front. And we saw a lot of that, we've heard some of that, and I saw a lot of that in, in, in Vegas this January with the new media exposition, where it was all about digital and it was all about new media. And the idea was that going forward, there's gonna be a real market for niche, hyper-targeted uh, attacks on consumers. And people are going to be willing to pay big money to get an ultra uh, precise and limited and targeted demographic. You know, uh, I want a shark. You know, I, 
and, and what I want is the shark. So when you're throwing the net and you're giving the shark, the dolphin, and the sardines, I don't want to pay for the rest of it. I just want to pay for the shark. It's a much wiser use of my resources. So we can do that. And I think one of the most important aspects going forward and facing the challenges of the digital age is they're inevitably going to be branding. Now, people in business, you're familiar with the old adage, program first, sell later. I think in the 21st century, it's all about brand first, sales and profits second. Um, Ad Age Industry recently put out a little uh, tidbit, and the basic uh, premise of this was that brands are built by being first in category, not just first in the marketplace, but first in mind. You've got to decide what it is you want to be, who you want to attract, and go about being the best at that particular function. And we can, we've got all kinds of examples that are all around the digital world. I mean, when you think about search engine, the first thing that comes to mind is Google. You think about social media, the first thing that comes to mind is Facebook. You think about software, Microsoft comes to the, to the fore. You think about mobile devices, well, it's all about the mother of all brands in Steve Jobs and Apple. I mean, people had to have Apple. It doesn't matter if Samsung had a superior product or, or Blackberry or anything else of that matter. It's like, I got to have it. It's like, it's like digital crack. Just give me my Apple. And we'll see where that's going to go going forward. But that's a great example of branding. And I think we know that people listen to radio stations more than radio programs. I might be wrong. But that's the feeling I have right now. And because I'll tell you why. I think everything is highly commoditized, especially music. But so is weather, sports, traffic. You can get that anywhere. The key is, how do you get the public to want to get it from you? And I think you've got the advantage of being trusted, established curators of that content. But the, the content doesn't belong to you. What belongs to you is the brand that you've created in the marketplace, the connection that you've made with your audience. It's the attachment listeners feel to your station. I think, you know, Marshall McLuhan will be sort of rolling over in his grave. But I think it's about the messenger and not the message. Because the message is now a globally available commodity. But what you have to work with is listener loyalty. And once you have them, they're hooked. They're yours. And they'll follow you anywhere, any platform, any app. Oh, I just saw a rap. Well, good luck. Uh, so what I'm saying is use your brand to hedge your bets against technologies. And here's where regulation sort of comes in as well. And I'll try and make this quick. But this is my point. We all know that Canadian music is highly successful and highly in demand. We also know that the Canadian public, and again, I'll go to a heritage study, show that 92% of Canadians feel it's important that they have access to Canadian music. Canadian music is a big winner worldwide. And we've got great examples of that, of our artists being the best at what they do in their particular market, their particular niche, globally. Because in today's world, it's all about competing globally. That little sort of hermetically sealed market we used to have is over with. So we've got examples, and you can like them or not like them, or like that kind of music or not, but look at these great examples we have of great Canadians in the music business that were somewhere, somehow, certainly aided by the system we've put into place. You know, Celine Dion, you can love her or hate her, but she's the best in her category. She's competing and winning on the world stage. Michael Bublé is doing the same thing in his category. Justin Bieber, love him or hate him, is doing the same thing in his category. Drake just won a Grammy for best rap. I mean, these are inspirational stories. And what I say to broadcasters is the following, that you've got a chance to have an advantage through what you may have seen at some point as a, as a regulatory obligation. I think it's more of a sort of, you can also look at it as a regulatory privilege or a regulatory advantage in that you can use Canadian music as the basis for your brand. And nobody else around the world can do that. So that being said, um, I think broadcasters proudly contributed, and this is something that should be of great pride to Canadians, and we saw examples of that yesterday at Cool House. But your industry contributed $54 million last year. That's a lot of money, as uh, some people would say, to, uh, to the development of Canadian artists through Factor, Radio, Star Maker. And our goal at the commission, and that's why I didn't get into too much of the details of what 
coming up in the Commission. But overall, our goal is to allow this industry to be the, the motor, the motor to contribute to the popularity of Canadian music. And my idea is we get out of the way and we let you guys push that music forward and at the same time it offers you a branding advantage that other people don't have. So, over to you. Who are you? What's your brand? I don't mean to get sort of existential list on you here. Uh, Nietzsche might be turning over in his grave as well. But um, how, do you, how are you building better connections with your audience so they like you and they get their friends to like you? Because once you've got them hooked, they're yours. It's a great paradigm. What new niche markets do you plan to pursue online? How will you capitalize on the extraordinary opportunities presented by emerging technologies? And the fact that you have commercially popular musical content in your own backyard. And how will you take advantage of Canadian content to gain a competitive edge in an international marketplace and build your brand? So I'm out of time. I thank you so much to coming out, for coming out and listening to us this morning. And I have no doubt you're all creative, innovative, energized, exciting, and competent people. I know you'll find a way to continue uh, this tremendous success story that is Canadian radio. I thank you for your time, and I wish you a good day.